Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu again from my sitting room here in my home in the Caribbean island of Trinidad. Uh, tonight is going to be a chat on several different topics. First of all, we could not make the last IBN lecture, uh, last uh, Yawmul Ahad or Sunday, uh, and that was because of uh, illness. Uh, my blood pressure was very high and I could make it, but uh, I prayed to Allah and I was still able to, to, to attend the brainstorming session. I thought I might not be able to do for the, be there for the whole session, but as soon as the session started, I felt better and I was able to attend the whole session. And as soon as I returned home from that brainstorming session on electronic and digital money, how should we respond to it, my blood pressure began to rise again. So Allah was kind that I was able to, to lead the discussion uh, in the brainstorming session on, on digital money. Uh, I hope to be uh, back again uh, at IBN uh, this coming Yawmul Ahad or Sunday. Uh, so wherever in the world you are, if you want to call um, after you listen to me today on what we did, uh, you are you're welcome to call on the phone during that session uh, from wherever you are in the world. Uh, as soon as you, we receive your call, I'll interrupt uh, my talk and take your call immediately. Uh, I suggest that you don't use the internet to call because the quality is terrible. We had a call from, from, uh, from Belgrade. I couldn't understand anything he was saying, yes. So we had the, the brainstorming session on, uh, on Sunday on Yom al uh, at the Jama Masjid San Fernando. And uh, I want to report to you on the, the results of that session. Uh, we had one sister who flew all the way from Washington to come and join us for that session. Um, we did not want more than 50 people present. And uh, we ended up with about 30. But uh, there were three masajid from Trinidad and Trinidad which were present for the session. And now, as a result of the session, all three are now going to look into the possibility of the, the masjid minting uh, dinar and dirham, uh, just as Masjid Al-Quds in Cape Town has been minting dinar for several years now. And our argument is if Masjid Al-Aqsa, at the time of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, if the masjid in, in Jerusalem, Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is in the Quran, if they could be minting gold and silver coins because the money in the market was haram money, there were um, graven images on the coins, Roman images, uh, so too today the masjid can, be, can also mint dinar and dirham because the money in, outside is becoming increasingly haram, from haram to more haram to even more haram. Um, the digital and electronic money which is coming is even more dangerous than the um, paper money that we are now using. Uh, so there will be uh, efforts now with the three masajid to initiate this process and pre hopefully we'll be able to get other um, uh, Hindu mandirs and Christian churches to join us um, so that people can come to, the, to their church or their mandir or their masjid and they can buy gold and silver coins. If the masjid is minting it, of course, it will be done on a non-commercial basis, no profit. When businessmen do it, of course, they'll want to do it for a profit. So when you go to the masjid or to the mandir or to the church to buy your gold and silver coins, you know that the price you're being charged is actually the price, the cost of the gold and silver and the cost of minting. Um, we, I, I, I noticed that there were some of those who were participating in our brainstorming session who were not as yet aware of what was money in the Quran and what was money in the Sunnah. 
and that there's therefore a need for us to teach the subject. Um, those of you who are listening to me and who already understand the subject of money in the Quran and money in the Sunnah, uh, you should teach it to others. You should teach it to others. Uh, we also found from our seminar or our brainstorming session that in the same way that uh, the world of Islamic scholarship responded a uh, hundred years ago to the introduction of paper money, particularly in India, British India, and after that in the rest of the world of Islam. And the Islamic scholarship failed while there were some scholars of Islam who had the insight to denounce it as haram and urge the people to stay away from it. The establishment did not do that. The established scholars of Islam, they accepted the money. And as a consequence, the whole world of Islam was sucked into this bogus and fraudulent and haram monetary system of paper money and then plastic money. And now, as we move towards digital and electronic money, uh, or what they call cryptocurrencies, and uh, the blockchain technology through which it functions, uh, we now see the scholars of Islam, the muftis of Islam, uh, there's one in Britain, I see, who are now preparing themselves, preparing themselves, yes, ominously so, to issue the fatwa. That this, even this, this money, which is even more bogus and more fraudulent, more dangerous than the paper money, even this is halal. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad, alayhi salatu waslam. Say what you want about the hadith, it is true. It has been fulfilled. The prophecy has been fulfilled. He said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, You shikwa yati ala nasi zaman. It will not be long before that time will come. La yabaka min al islami lasma. When nothing will remain of Islam but the name. Wa la yabaka min al Qurani ila rasma. When nothing will remain of the Quran except the traces of the writing. Because you will be they will be abandoning the Qur'an, they'll be forsaking the Qur'an, they'll be neglecting the Qur'an, they'll be betraying the Qur'an. That's why nothing will remain of the Qur'an but the traces of writing, of the writing. مَسَاجِدُهُمْ عَمِرَةٌ وَهِيَ خَرَابٌ مِنَ الْهُدَى You will know that age when it comes because the masajid, plural of masjid, would be grand structures, iron and steel, multi-million dollar buildings, but devoid of guidance. Look around you today and you'll see them. <laughs> the more misguided they are, the bigger the masjid they built. Yes, the masajid would be grand structures, but devoid of guidance. And Nabi Muhammad Wasallam ended with this ominous, these ominous words. He said, Ulama'uhum sharrul nasi mimman tahta adimis sama. The ulama of that time and of those people, the scholars, the religious scholars of Islam at that time and of those people, would be the worst people beneath the sky. Min indihim takhrujul fitna wa fihim ta'ud. From them will emerge fitna, that which, be, which, which, which would be a, not only a test and a trial, but a catastrophe for the people. And they will be the centers of fitna. Hmm? Fitna will return to them. So when we, when we discussed uh, last uh, Yom al Ahad in our brainstorming session, uh, anticipating the fatwa which is still to come, but it is not coming yet, it is coming when the... <laughs> The muftis are going to declare uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin to be halal. Uh, this is yet another sign of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, that the scholars of Islam would become, would be the worst people beneath the sky. How do we prepare? How do we respond? There's only one answer to that, only one. And that is that we have to return to the Qur'an, return to the Sunnah, return to gold and silver coins, and uh, therefore we have to make an effort to pre make it available for the people. That's the first step. Make it available for the people to buy gold and silver coins. 
And then the next step after that would be to create small markets, uh, at least for food. At least for food. If you cannot buy gasoline for your car with a gold and silver coin, at least you can buy food and survive. So a market for food, where people can go and buy food using gold and silver coin, that is our first priority. The market cannot, of course, be in the center of the city. That will be too, too much of a threat to their system. So the market will have to be in the countryside. Uh, there was a criticism of me from a university in, was it Pakistan, perhaps? He is in a rocking chair in his air-conditioned sitting room in his home in Trinidad, and he is telling us to go and go into some remote village. Oh, what, what a pathetic reply. What pathetic minds would respond like that? Oh, no, no, no. I already have my arrangements. I already have them in place to move to the remote countryside. Yes. And I'm setting, setting the place, setting up the place. We're going to have animals there. We'll have our own milk. We'll have our own meat. We'll have our own vegetables. We already done that in, in Malaysia, where the Institute of Islamic Eschatology is located. It is in the remote countryside. I have my own home there. And uh, there's vegetables all around us. People are farming. And we have about maybe, what, 30, 40, 50 animals on our property. Goats, yes. Yeah. So we have milk, we have meat, and we have vegetables, and we have to store water, that's all. So this is a pathetic response that I got from the Islamic University. Now then, we turn to, after the brainstorming session, just to remind you that this coming Yawmul Ahad, and maybe the one after that, before, because after that I may have to travel. I hope I'll be well enough. Uh, my blood pressure would be stabilized and I can then travel. Uh, you'll be able for these two sessions, uh, IBN sessions, to call on the phone and to discuss and chat with me on the phone and uh, for every, all the others to listen to what you have to say on the subject of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technology through which it is uh, going to uh, function and how we should respond to it. I had some calls from Kerala in India and I'm so happy and proud to see South India is awake and uh, studying the subject. Uh, the emails from Kashmir, from the uh, Indian side of Kashmir, where they are also um, aware of the subject and they've been writing to me uh, from several countries in Africa, from Bosnia. So you can call uh, when, uh, when we have our program at IBN on Yawmul Ahad or Sunday. The telephone numbers will be at the bottom of the screen. And I'll be happy to receive your calls, inshallah. You'll only have this this coming Sunday and then the following Sunday, that's all. Uh, then I'll probably have to travel. Now then, let us go on to a second subject now. I hope we can do all that we want to do tonight. Uh, there are dramatic events taking place in Saudi Arabia. The Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman, I think is his name, the son of King Salman, the youngest son, who's just about... 32 years of age, and he's behaving like a schoolboy. All that <laughs> the Saudi royal family had built over, how many, almost 100 years, 1924, almost 100 years. All that King Abdulaziz ibn Saud and his sons had built over almost 100 years while functioning as clients of the United States of America and Britain, and consolidated their power in that country. It's all now under threat of collapse because of this young man. Uh, my uh, uh, feeling is that not, it's not just uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman attempting to consolidate power in Saudi Arabia. And as a consequence, you have this infighting and two or three princes of the royal family have been killed already. And there must be great resentment now, great resentment in the royal family and an open split in the royal family. Um, this is the first time that this has happened uh, in the history of Saudi Arabia, almost a hundred years now. 
And I want to suggest to my uh, viewing audience around the world that there's a, another picture behind this picture of a, a grab for power. I think that the, the, Saudi, um, the Saudi religious scholarship that is supporting the, so, sorry, the Wahhabi religious scholarship that is supporting the Saudi regime, I think that they are now convinced uh, that our analysis is correct, and that is that uh, the Pax Americana is now in irreversible decline, and that Pax Judaica is now set to replace Pax Americana. I think they are now convinced also that what we have, um, and what we are, our analysis is that the nuclear war or Malhama is around the corner, and that uh, Israel will soon make a grab for power that there will be a great war, and in that great war, Israel, the territory of Israel is going to expand dramatically, or at least they're going to ex attempt to expand dramatically, in order that uh, the biblical frontiers of the Holy Land, that is from the river of Egypt, that is the river Nile, to the river Euphrates, that is what the Bible says, and the Quran, of course, and the Hadith confirm this is false, but that's what they believe. So Dajjal cannot rule over an Israel and claim to be al-Masih or the Messiah unless and until Israel ex expands its territorial frontiers to encompass the false biblical frontiers of the state. The Saudi uh, religious leaders and the Saudi part of the Saudi regime now recognize that this is the reality that they face. And as soon as that war takes place, which can be any time now, and as soon as Israel launches out, comes out from behind the hijab, and uh, wages this big war, uh, there is going to be uh, um, there is going to be a, situ a situation will arise in Saudi Arabia that they cannot cope with. Number one, the Hajj will be abandoned immediately. You cannot have the Hajj. But other than that, number two, there will be tremendous resentment against the Saudi regime, tremendous resentment uh, against the, the Wahhabi religious scholarship, and uh, the very great livelihood, likelihood of revolution, revolutionary um, change in Saudi Arabia. So my analysis is that in anticipation of this, they are now seeking to find a way out of their predicament. And the way out is to transform the, the environment, the strategic environment in which they are located into one in which the, the front burner will be a Sunni-Shia civil war. And in that Sunni-Shia civil war, Saudi Arabia must be the champion of the Sunnis. And that is their insurance policy for survival. So you need a new kind of leadership in Saudi Arabia which will attack Iran vigorously and try to provoke a civil war, Sunni-Shia civil war, not just Saudi-Iranian civil war, no, no, Sunni-Shia civil war. And uh, this is why they're treating Qatar so with such great hostility, because Qatar, Qatar is not prepared to play ball, that's why. And uh, if Qatar does not come along with them, then there are many other Islamic Muslim states who are going to follow Qatar and say, no, we don't want to be a part of the Sunni Shia civil war. Pakistan is already backing out of it. And we see a um, momentous change in Pakistan taking place now at this time. So that my analysis of what is happening in Saudi Arabia is that this is uh, an attempt by the Saudi regime, part of the Saudi regime, to try to survive what is ahead of them. But before I end this brief analysis, an incomplete analysis of the events in Saudi Arabia, let me return to a prophecy of Prophet Muhammad uh, in which the Salafi are in disagreement with me, as usual. Uh, Prophet prophesied amongst the signs of the last day the uh, advent of Imam al-Mahdi. Um, and he said that the event which will trigger the emergence of Imam al-Mahdi 
uh, in which he publicly come out in public and declare himself to be the Mahdi, would be the death of a Khalifa. And upon the death of that Khalifa, um, there would be disagreement concerning succession. It is as plain as daylight to me, and I have said this for the last how many, maybe 20 years now I've been saying it, that the Khalifa who will die, I, I want to suggest, would be a Saudi king. No, said the Salafi. No, says Hizbut Tahrir. No. Hizbut Tahrir and the Salafi declare it has to be a Khalifa, so the Khilafa will be restored. <laughs> And the, the restoration of the Khilafah before the advent of Imam al-Mahdi had become a cardinal, cardinal part of their belief system. Well, they can keep waiting for that. My analysis has been different. I don't know whether there's any other scholar who, who has supported me on this view, but I have been very plain and clear and public in my statement that I am of the opinion that the Khilafa who will die would be a Saudi king. And there have been many who have supported this view, who have accepted it. Um, and when the Saudi king dies, there would be open disagreement concerning succession. Uh, this could possibly happen with the, king, with the death of Salman. While Salman is still alive, uh, he has the power in the country. But when Salman dies and his son Muhammad is now become, going to become the king of Saudi Arabia, I think I may just be right that that would be the moment when we're going to have open disagreement within the Saudi royal family concerning succession. At that time, said the Prophet wasalam, a man will come out of Medina and hurry to Mecca. And uh, the people of Mecca will come out to him and urge him and force him to accept the bay'ah to become the Khalifa. So the Khilafa state would be restored. The Khilafa state would be restored with Imam al-Mahdi because he would be Imam al-Mahdi. And he would accept the bay'ah or the oath of allegiance. Um, uh, I think it's at the Kaaba by the Black Stone between the Black Stone and Maqam Ibrahim, I think. I'm not too sure. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, he would proclaim himself to be Imam al-Mahdi. Uh, which means that perhaps King Salman has a few years well to live again. Because I'm not anticipating that this can take place before the Malhama. The Great War has to take place first. Uh, a, day like a, a day like a week may have already commenced may have already commenced. Some of you have been saying that. I have not said it, but I am saying it tonight. That the uh, Dajjal's day, like a week, may have already commenced. But Pax Judaica, I don't think, has it yet commenced. And when Pax Judaica commences, uh, it will only be a very short period of time. Um, and then Dajjal will declare himself to be the Messiah, and then the Imam can emerge. I, 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 can't, I anticipate that this is going to take a few years. I don't know how you, I mean, King Salman is going to live that long. So maybe that I'm wrong in my analysis, and some of you may be able to correct me. Uh, remember that when I give an opinion, uh, you must never accept my opinion unless you are convinced that I am correct. And I have been wrong in the past, yes, I have been wrong. I anticipated that nuclear war will take place uh, uh, this year. It has not taken place so far. Last year it has not taken place. Um, but I know it's coming. It's coming soon. When it will come, I don't know. So these are my brief comments concerning the events in Saudi Arabia. It is a subject that we have to continue to watch carefully uh, and continue to have our analysis. Now then, um, a very important matter, and that is that uh, my book on Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwalu Zaman, uh, the English version, uh, the formatting of the book is completed, the index is completed, 
Everything is ready for it to go to the printery. Uh, we got a quotation from one printery already for 3,000 copies. And we're waiting for another quotation from another printery. And alhamdulillah, I had money to print only 1,000 copies. And now we have uh, the money to print all. Alhamdulillah. Um, the French translation is, 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 is taking place. I hope the French translation will be completed soon. And we will we'll have the money also to print the book in French as well as in English. Um, so that's the good news. And I've now returned to my second book on Dajjal entitled uh, From Jesus, the True Messiah uh, to Dajjal, the False Messiah, uh, A Journey in Islamic Eschatology. Do please make dua uh, when you raise your hand that Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala might give me health and give me life and give me freedom because we live in a dangerous time now. We don't know when we might lose our freedom so that I may be able to write these books on Dajjal, inshallah, uh, while still I have life, I still have health, and I still have freedom. Dua is very, very important. If you call on Allah, Allah can answer dua. Maybe your dua might be answered. So that's the news for the book on Dajjal. You can pre-order the book, just send an email. I've asked them to put it on my bookstore, but they have not put it as yet, a, a, a link for ordering, but just send an email to pre-order the book. Now then, about marriage, uh, and all our sisters who want to get married, and all the brothers out there, I had a huge number of brothers who wrote to me who want to get wives or second wives, and who want to get milk al yamin Well, let me first remind you, you cannot ask a sister to become your milk al yamin No. Milk al yamin is a second-class status to that of a full wife. And a woman cannot be invited to accept a second-class status because she's not going to be maintained equally with your wife. And if you die, she does not inherit from you. If she has children, of course, the children of the milk al yamin has equal status with the children of the wife of Nikah. But since she is going to have a second class status, you cannot invite her to accept that status. No, no, I protest. It is she who has to offer herself. And she will offer herself only if there is no alternative. She cannot get a husband. She's not prepared to take a garbage bin as a husband. No, she wants to get a good man. She wants to get a pious man. She wants to get a man with some qualities, some character, some intelligence, some piety, a man of certain status, a man of some spiritual elements, element, ele um, eminence. She wants such a man. And if she cannot find such a man as a husband, she's not prepared to accept a garbage bin. No. So in the event that a woman, a sister, cannot find a husband that is suitable to her, and she finds a man who has these qualities and who has the means to maintain, she can offer herself to him, not to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, <laughs> excuse my language. She, she is going to offer herself to someone who is suitable to her, who meets her standards. And when she offers herself to him, and he has the means to be able to maintain her, he has to be careful, very careful, to turn her down. Yes. Remember, we live in dangerous times. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to every woman the right to a husband or to a guardian. A man does not have a right to a wife. No. But a woman has a right to a husband or to a guardian. And a man has a duty to marry 
or to accept her as Milkal Yameen, which is a second kind of marriage, really. So if she offers herself to you, and if you have the means to maintain her, then you have to be very, very, very careful before you turn her request down. I want to remind you of the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, which I have always understood or rather misunderstood. And tonight I want to correct myself. He said that among the signs of the last day, is that one man would have to maintain 50 women, one man. This does not mean that every man out there will have to do that. This means that there will be some men who will have to do this, will have to maintain 50 women. Maintaining 50 women is not having sexual relations with 50 women. Wrong. He said maintain them. Why would this take place? Answer, one of the reasons could be, and this is the one I've always been mentioning, a precipitous or alarming decline in the birth of baby boys, and therefore a preponderance of baby girls, and you don't have enough boys to marry the girls. This is the view I've always been mentioning for years and years and years now. But now I'm realizing that, wait, this is not the whole story. Remember he said that not only would women dress like men, which is already happening, so women will assume the functional role of men in society, misguided women. But he said that men would dress like women, in, which would imply that men will abandon their role and function in society of maintaining women. Yes. Men will stop maintaining women. Mm. As men stop maintaining women, men stop marrying women. They prefer to be single. They don't want to marry. That's right. As men stop maintaining women, or they would marry, and she has to go and work to maintain them. I've seen this with my eyes. Yes. So this is an age in which we are now moving towards this calamitous decline and collapse of the functional role of men and women in society. So as men stop maintaining women, large numbers of women are going to be without husbands. Large numbers. Increasing numbers of women without husbands. And therefore, an, 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 an increasing decline, calamitous decline in the number of men who will maintain women. And therefore, men of piety, men of substance, men who are truly men of Islam and who have the means to maintain, these are the ones who are now going to have to do what has never been done, never been done before in history. Yes. If I had the means to do it, I'd do it myself. I would build huts, a village, and build huts for all the women who want to come and live in the village, who are single women. So a woman will have a place to live in a little hut, yes, like the wives of the Prophet, and the village will feed them. You have enough food in the village to feed them. They have security because you're living in a community. You have company, you're not lonely. You know how many women are lonely in the world today? If you cannot get a male companion as a husband, or as you, 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 his milk al yameen, and you have to live with that part of your life not fulfilled, at least the other parts will be fulfilled. So this is the, this is the meaning that one man would have to maintain 50 women. Why? because increasing numbers of women are going to be single with no one to maintain them, and increasing numbers of men are going to be abandoning their role of maintaining and taking care of women. That is my understanding of the Hadith now. 
So we have this large number of people who have responded to my last um, lecture on the subject. And what I need now is I cannot have my assistant doing this work of managing this site because she has many other things to do. What I would like to do is to find maybe a husband and wife team, and not young, maybe some, some elderly people, a husband and wife team who will contact me and assume, be willing to assume this responsibility. And I will then forward to you all the emails I've got from the brothers and all the emails I've got from the sisters. And this is a delicate task. This has to be performed with delicacy, carefully, uh, to ensure that you protect our sisters and don't put them into a situation that is difficult for them. And then as you, as, it, as this, this, this marriage site is managed efficiently, Alhamdulillah, we'll be able to pair them off and marriages will take place. And when a sister finds someone who is suitable and she wants to offer herself as Milkal Yameen to him, and he agrees to accept her as Milkal Yameen, then remember what I have said to you. Remember, you will have to have a contract of nikah in order to protect yourself from a charge of zina. Once you have the contract of nikah, no one can open their mouth. Between you and Allah, the relationship is milk al yamin. Yes. So if you do not maintain her equally with your wife, the society has nothing to do with that. Nothing. You are entering into this relationship as milk al yamin. You accepted that he will maintain you to the extent that he has the capacity to maintain you. Uh, will there have to be a legal framework to ensure that when you die, uh, such a milk al yamin does not make a claim on your property? This is beyond my, uh, my scholarship. Uh, someone will have to advise on that. So I hope and pray that uh, we'll have some volunteers. Please um, contact me, send me an email if you're prepared to manage uh, this marriage site so that we can pair off now the very large numbers of people who have contacted me, even from Pakistan, <laughs> uh, that they would like to get uh, uh, married. They need a spouse. And uh, don't write to me and tell me if you're a brother that you want a milk al -yamin. No. If you're a sister, you can offer yourself. If you're a brother, you cannot ask for it. Good. All right, then. Uh, I, have, I made a mistake, and I want to correct it. Um, concerning China and uh, the gold dinar, I mean the gold coins, Someone has sent me an email to inform me that gold and silver coins were freely, freely available in China and there were millions of auto, automatic machines um, that you could go like an ATM machine. And uh, I got an email from China a few days ago, a very important person in China, who said to me, no, Sheikh, that's not true. Yes, the gold and silver coins are freely available in China, millions and millions of, of, of what you call them, banks, where you can go and buy gold coins. Uh, the Chinese do that. They, they're buying the gold and silver coins from the banks, but not from a machine. So I have corrected myself on that issue. Now, before I end today, um, there is one more subject. It is a very important subject. Uh, let me see if I can summarize it. Uh, over this last one week, uh, the world has commemorated the 100th anniversary of the, the centenary of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, in, which occurred in Russia in uh, November of 1917. Uh, they used the Justinian calendar, and on this side of the world, they used the Gregorian calendar. And I think there are a few days difference between the two. This is why this side celebrates Christmas in December, and that side celebrates Christmas in January, because of the difference between the Justinian calendar and the Gregorian calendar. 
Anyhow, the Bolshevik Revolution took place a hundred years ago, and a hundred years later, it is <laughs> crystal clear to me that this was a plot, this was a plan, a cleverly designed satanic plan on the part of the Western world, the powers of the Western world, to destroy Orthodox Christianity in Russia, to take control of Russia and to brutalize Russia. And uh, in the process of doing that, to be able to fulfill the major goal of the world, First World War, we started in 1914, and which was almost completed by 1917 when the Bolshevik Revolution took place. When uh, the Western world was planning for the First World War, they started several years before. They're planning it like a, it's like a chessboard, moving the pawns on the chessboard. They plan in advance. This is what they're doing with electronic money, planned way in advance while we are eating uh, roti chanai and drinking te tari. They are plotting and planning ahead in advance, yeah, many years ahead. It was in 1900. Was it 1909 or 1908 or 1907? Excuse me, I can't remember. When they negotiated, Britain and France negotiated with Russia to try to embrace Russia, who was a traditional foe, a rival to the West. Oh, yes, because that was Orthodox Christianity, and this is Western Christianity, and the two didn't have much love for each other at all. So it was a surprising move on the part of Britain and France to reach out to Russia and to try to seduce Russia into entering an alliance with them. And uh, the bait which they use, um, which uh, the, the Russian government swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the Tsar Nicholas was the Tsar of Russia at that time, uh, was that if we win this war, you will get Constantinople. That's right. And that was too great a bait for Russia <laughs> not to accept. The bait is being offered to Iran now. So long as Ayatollah Khamenei is there, I don't think Iran would swallow that bait. No. So long as Ayatollah Khamenei is in charge of Iran, I don't think Iran will swallow the bait. I won't tell you what the bait is. It's too volatile a subject. So let me leave that, be silent on that subject. What is the bait being offered to Iran? But they offered a bait to Russia. And the bait was Constantinople. That if we win this war, you get Constantinople. And Russia accepted the bait, and Russia had entered into an alliance with Britain and France. Astonishingly, first time in history. First time, I believe. If I'm wrong, correct me. Why did they reach out to Russia? Answer? They wanted to checkmate the Ottoman Empire. The major target of the war was not Germany. The major target of the war was not Russia. The major target of the war was the Ottoman Empire. They wanted to defeat the Ottoman Empire. They wanted to dismantle the Ottoman Empire so that they could liberate the Holy Land and they could restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land. That is the major point, the major objective of the First World War. And uh, if the Ottoman Empire, which has traditionally been a friend of Britain and France, and Russia has always been the greatest enemy of all of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans waged endless wars against Russia, endless wars, and great hatred for Russia, the, the Tatar in Crimea were always enslaving the Russians and selling them as slaves <laughs> to, Istanbul, to Constantinople. Yeah, they were very happy to have Russian slaves. So, and then they were, sometimes they'll take the slaves back to, to Moscow, I mean, uh, to, to, to try to get a, the release of the slaves. They have to pay for them. I forget the use of the word now. What is it? To, to, to um, ransom, sorry, to ransom the slaves. Anyhow, when you, when you read the history of the Tata in Crimea, you could see the role that they were playing in, ho in the hostile relations with Russia on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. 
So if Russia were to join with Britain and France in an alliance, then in the coming war, the Ottoman Empire will not be able to join on this side, which they would almost not automatically do. The, Russia, the, the, America, sorry, the British and the French wanted the Ottomans to join the side of Germany. And therefore, in order to force them to join the side of Germany, they had to bring Russia into their fold. Once Russia is with them, the Ottomans will not come. So that's how they were able to push the Ottoman Empire into a corner so that the Ottoman Empire will be on the other side, on the support of Germany in the war. And number two, when the war did start, they were to cleverly ensure that Russia did all the fighting. <laughs> Well, there, the Russian, the British and the French will do some side maneuverings and so on and pretend that they were fighting and that they had suffering great losses and so on in Dardanelles. But the master plan was that the Russians would do the bulk of the fighting, that the Russians would suffer the most from the war, that the mighty Ottoman Empire's war machine will be all forced to launch their wars against Russia, not Britain and France so much, but Russia. And as Russia took blow after blow after blow after blow, large numbers of Russians are being killed in the war, the Russian economy will be under strain. And then you have to have someone who agrees to this stupid plan of printing and printing and printing more and more paper money to try to finance the war. That's what the Zionists wanted, so that you can have inflation in Russia. And as inflation get up to, to runaway inflation, the farmers now can get nothing for their food that they produce. So instead of producing the food and bringing it to the market, the farmers prefer to produce just enough food for themselves. And so there's massive starvation in, the Rus in Russia. And calamitous, calamitous um, inflation in Russia. And whenever you have this runaway inflation, you're going to have you're going to have resentment in the masses, as you're seeing there in Venezuela. Yes, this is the most dangerous weapon that the Jal has today in the modern world, and that is inflation. Inflation. And three times in the Quran, Allah has prohibited it. Do you know the verse? Have you ever been told? Three times in the Quran, Allah has said, Ba'da'uzu billahi min shaitanir rajim. He says, Wala ashia'ahum. Do not diminish people's property. Do not cause the value of people's property to diminish. The value of people's labor to diminish becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. This is bakhs. Um, and this is done through inflation. When, and the inflation has come as a consequence of the bogus monetary system. As the value of the money falls, the prices rise. So anytime they want to target a government to try to bring about re regime change, they attack you with inflation. That is the most important point today in the world. It's not nuclear war at all. The most important one is inflation. So every government now is careful not to cross the line because they know if they cross the line, the price that they will pay is inflation. And if they have inflation, the people will turn against them and there will be revolution and the government will be swept away. So they're all very careful to toe the line that Wall Street writes for them. This is what happened in Russia. And as the farmers stop producing food and as prices continue to rise above and above and above and above, it was not socialism, no, that caused the Bolshevik revolution. Don't come with that kind of argument to me that it was capitalism versus socialism in Soviet Union, in Russia, and the Bolshevik Revolution came because... No, no, no. It is, it is a Zionist conspiracy to bring about a monetary system that will cause inflation. That is the, that is the cause of it. And so the, the regime in, in Russia, as a 1917 approach, was becoming increasingly popular, unpopular, mm. and the conditions were being created as they're trying to do it in Venezuela now for the regime to be overthrown. And eventually, in November of 1917, the revolution took place. 
and then they took control of Russia. They then proceeded to establish the Soviet Union as an atheist state so that they could destroy and dismantle the orthodox Christian foundations of Russian society. This is my uh, brief analysis of the Bolshevik Revolution. I want my sons who are scholars of Islam tomorrow and my daughters who are going to be scholars, I want you to do your homework as I have done my homework. I'm setting the example for you that you not only have to study the Quran and the Hadith, you also have to study the world and study history and study politics and study economics and you must be able to integrate them all. And our point of integration here is eschatology. This is all being done so that they could further their designs in the Holy Land, so that eventually Pax Judaica will replace Pax Americana, and that a man will stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. No, he will not be the Messiah. He will be Dajjal, the false Messiah. I want to thank you once again for this chance uh, to talk to you from my sitting room here in the Caribbean island of Trinidad. And uh, I may have another one session with this and two more at IBN before I travel. And after that, when I'm abroad, I hardly think I'll have a chance to do the recording. So do please raise your hands and make dua for me that I may be able to have safe travel. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samir alim. Wa tuba alayna ya mawlana inna ka inta tawwab rahim. Barahmatika ya arhamar rahmi. Ameen.